Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Marotti, and across the street from the Pentagon, where we are at the offices of the F-35 Lightning II fighter program, the Joint Strike Fighter, and we're honored to have with us as our guest joining us uh, the outgoing program executive officer for the F-35 program, Lieutenant General uh, Chris Bogdan. Sir, thanks very much for taking some time with us. Vago, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss the program with you as I uh, leave the PEO of the F-35. Um, I, I, I wanted to start off uh, first by asking you, um, give us an update on the program. You know, what's the performance of the jet? Where are we in terms of cost? And what are some of the outstanding challenges that your successor, um, Vice Admiral Matt Winter, is, is going to have to handle? Well, the program has made a lot of progress over the last few years. Um, uh, today, when it comes to the development of the program, we can actually see the light at the end of the tunnel for that big development program that started in 2001. We think uh, by the end of this year we'll be um, just about done with all the flight testing that will deliver the full capability of the airplane. We'll take 2018 to finish out some of the spec compliance things and, and then sometime between the beginning of the year and the springtime we'll deliver the full capability of the airplane, uh, the A, the B and the C model. Um, relative to our production ramp, we're in the midst of the biggest production ramp that this program is ever going to see. Um, we're going from about 60 airplanes a year uh, next year to 90 to 120, and then all the way up to over 150 in the next three-plus years. Uh, and we're in the midst of that, and it's going fairly well. Uh, additionally, we're attempting to build a global sustainment enterprise throughout the whole world. Uh, we've broken the world up into three regions, Pacific region, North American region, and European region. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a full sustainment capability in each of those regions such that any F-35, no matter who owns it in a particular region, would never have to take their jet out of that region to get the full spectrum of sustainment capabilities from repairs to part supply to depot maintenance. So we're in the midst of building that up. That's going to be, take another three or four years um, to get there. Relative to costs on the program, um, the development cost has stabilized out. We know how much it's going to cost to finish the development program. And despite what some of the critics say about it being a billion dollars more, uh, we're not tracking to that. We're tracking to be right on budget to what we told the department this year and last year we would finish the development program with. Relative to the cost of production, continue to continues to come down. Uh, as you saw from lot 9 to lot 10, we saw about a 7.5% reduction in, in the price of each of the models of the airplane. We're going to continue to see those trends as we move into lot 11 and beyond with lot 12, 13, and 14. The goal there is by 2020 to deliver an A model airplane that's about $79 million, including an engine, including all the fees in 2020 dollars, and have the B and the C model commensurately come down uh, about the same percentage wise. So from that perspective, we're pretty pretty pleased with the, the cost curve that we're on. ONS costs uh, are coming down. They're just not coming down as quickly as we'd like them to. Uh, we've got to work really hard on our reliability and maintainability. We've got to work really hard on improving our supply chain so that the cost for flying the airplane continues to come down just like the procurement cost of the airplane. Um, has the ALICE system, which is that integrated logistics system for the aircraft, um, it was problematic last time we spoke, which was uh, at the Royal International Air Tattoo. What kind of progress has been made on that, and how is that affecting your cost per flying hour? Right. ALICE, a uh, complicated system, uh, millions and millions and millions of lines of code. Um, we put out a new version of ALICE starting at the beginning of the year, um, which integrated the engine into the system as well as tracking all the parts on the airplane that have to be periodically inspected. That was a big capability. Um, it's late. That, that increment is late. We wanted to put it out in the field starting in January. It really got out into the field starting in March, so we were a few months late doing that. But in the places we've put it out, it's done a much, much better job than the previous version of Alice in doing those things. Until we have all of the units on that version of Alice and continue to improve it, we're going to see manpower in the field a little higher than we want to, which then results in a higher cost to operate the airplane. So Alice and improving it is, is one of the keys to getting the operating and sustainment cost of the airplane down. Um, Alice, from a technical perspective, is looking pretty good. It's just a little bit behind because it was harder than we thought to, to put out this new increment. Do you think, um, let, me, let me go to the unit cost of the aircraft. One of the uh, key 
features of the program has always been volume. Volume is what's going to be your salvation in terms of getting down to that cost. But Congress occasionally has not really cooperated, and there have been some, some movement in the overall numbers that are going to be in the program. Are you confident that the number of the jets you need to get back on that schedule are going to be supported by the Congress to keep you on that track? And how much motion can there be in the money Congress gives you that doesn't then negatively impact the program? Right. Well, one, one of the good things about the F-35 program is um, the airplane is being purchased not only by the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. In fact, nearly 50 percent of the volume of airplanes we're going to procure in the next three to five years are from our FMS customers and our partners. So as long as there's not a large variation in what they do, uh, any moderate variation in what the U.S. services do really doesn't have a great impact. But having said that, over the last three years, the Congress has been very supportive and has added airplanes to what the department has asked for. In fact, in the last two years, they've added 17 more airplanes, and, and I believe this year's um, bill also adds airplanes in addition, 11 more airplanes in addition to what the department asked for. So from that perspective, we feel fairly confident that the numbers uh, for the program of record moving along are going to stay where they are or even get higher. And as you, and as you correctly stated, uh, one of the keys to driving down the cost is the volume. Uh, we think the volume is going to be there. We have future FMS customers that will probably come on to add to that even. So, so from that perspective, uh, we're, we're not all that concerned. Let me take you to operational lessons learned. Uh, aircraft is now operational, uh, declared operational IOC. The Marine Corps was the first one to do that, followed by the United States Air Force. Uh, Navy is still working on that in terms of getting the full IOC declaration on it. Um, what are some of the operational lessons learned? You know, you have some aircraft that are in the UK. You have an aircraft, uh, the, Jap the uh, excuse me, the Marine Corps aircraft are at Iwakuni now. What are some of the lessons learned you're, you're picking up when these aircraft are making it out there into the field? Yeah. including in Europe where you're having um, a deployment as well. Right. We, we have airplanes now um, either deploying or located all over the world. We've got a unit of the U.S. Marine Corps permanently stationed in, in Iwakuni, as you said. Uh, we have the Israelis who have five airplanes uh, in Israel flying operationally today. Uh, we have three airplanes in Italy. Uh, we just came back from a U.S. Air Force deployment in Europe. Um, and, and one of the one of the main things we're learning is that this airplane, from a capability standpoint, is a game changer. Uh, in, in all of those deployments and exercises that we've um, participated in, um, un unanimously what folks are coming back, both the fourth generation airplanes and the folks that are flying the F-35, is that this is creating a different way of fighting an air war. And, and what I mean by that is the F-35 um, not only is it really hard to find from its stealth capabilities, it can go very deep into the battle space uh, and survive. And with the combination of its sensors and its fusion capability, co provide a very, very clear picture, uh, a very clear situational awareness to the pilot of what's going on in, in the battle space. We can take that information and we can pass it to other platforms and, and, and other folks to make them even smarter. And I think that's the one thing that over the past year and a half, as the airplane's gotten into the hands of the warfighter, and we have 210 airplanes out there in the hands of the warfighter now, we're finding that this airplane is a force multiplier. It can take that picture of the battle space and provide it to fourth generation airplanes and other platforms and make them smarter and make them much more survivable. And, and that's a big deal because that's just more than a fighter airplane. That's an airplane that when you put it in the battle space, everybody's game gets raised. I, I want to take you to the connectivity question because one of the um, challenges with the F-22, for example, was that F-22s talk to F-22s. They don't talk all that well to other things uh, in, the, in the force. And if you talk to the Air Force Chief of Staff, uh, General Goldfein, he's saying that, look, his priority, even in a fiscally constrained or even a fiscally rich environment, is give me more airmen, but also give me a battle network to connect all of the different disparate pieces of my force, legacy as well as future. When you're looking at it, give us the state of you know where we are in terms of the connectivity of the F-35 with the existing force right now. Do you have that degree of connectivity that is integral to this aircraft being a full success? We connect, the F-35 connects with other platforms in basically three ways. We connect classically with our radios um, talking to each other. We connect with Link 16, which is the common network carrier across many of our fourth generation platforms. One of the critiques about the F-22 in the past was it didn't have Link 16, so it couldn't talk to those fourth generation airplanes. 
With Link 16 on the F-35, you are able to take that picture I was telling you about and pass it to Super Hornets and pass it to F-16s and pass it to F-15s um, in, a, in, a, in an, an environment where it's okay to transmit. Now, if you're in a stealth mode, we have a system on the airplane called MATL. Um, uh, it's a data link that's a low probability of intercept data link. Today, that data link is just between common F-35s flying together. But the Navy just did a, a, a demonstration last year where they actually linked up our Mattel F-35 with an Aegis cruiser, and we were a and and that Aegis cruiser was able to shoot down a, a low altitude. Um, near supersonic missile being targeted at the Aegis without the Aegis cruiser ever seeing the missile because of that link with Mattel between the F-35, which could see that target and pass the targeting information to the Aegis cruiser. So what we think is that's a demonstration of the, the unique capability of the F-35. And, and I think what the, the department's going to figure out is the sooner we can both with Link 16 in a greater degree, and with MATL, the low probability of intercept communication link, link up more platforms, we'll get to that network that, that General Goldfein is looking for, where everyone in the battle space has an equal picture. Even before he was president, Donald Trump uh, started to put some pressure on the F-35 program, uh, said that there should be a competition between a similar, uh, a comparable version of the F-18. Uh, there are a lot of experts who say that there isn't a comparable version of the F-18 extant right now. But talk to us a little bit about the competition between these two aircraft. Um, you know, you were part of those discussions. You were part of those meetings. Talk to us a little bit about what this means, what it, does it mean for the program, you know, and what's the business case you're making in this competition for the F-35 to, to win, uh, win the argument at the end of the day? Yeah, first and foremost, I'm not a salesman for the F-35. So um, what the department decides in terms of quantities of their airplanes, um, my job is to just run the best program I can, no matter how many F-35s they choose to buy. But relative to um, the comparison between the F-18 and the F-35, one thing was clear in our conversations with the new administration, as well as within the department um, with uh, some of the new folks coming on, is that you cannot replace an F-35 with even the most advanced version of a Super Hornet when you're at the high-end fight. It just can't, it, it just doesn't work. Um, there's great things you can do to a, a Hornet, a Super Hornet to make it better, but you can't get it to do the things that the F-35 does today. Everybody realizes that. That's why when people talk about the competition between the Super Hornet and the F-35, um, we all look, including the Navy, and say, we think those airplanes are complementary. They're not in competition with, e with each other. Um, as I talked about before, how an F-35 can make other airplanes smarter, in the same way a Super Hornet and an F-35 flying together are a very, very viable and a very, very good combination of airplanes. And that's what the Navy's plan has always been over the next two decades, to put on their large deck carriers a combination of advanced Super Hornets and F-35s that could work together um, to bring the fight to the enemy. So when we look at it and when I look at it, I don't look at it as an either or for the Navy. I look at it as how many airplanes can they afford to buy of both. Um, the other thing that was very clear that we made to the administration was even if an advanced Super Hornet was getting to be near on par with an F-35, an advanced Super Hornet can't replace the A model and it cannot replace the B model. It can't replace the A model because the U.S. Air Force is going to buy you know, 1,763 of them, they've never had a Super Hornet in their inventory, and that just doesn't make sense. Uh, for the B model, unless you can build a Super Hornet that can go up and down and, and land vertically on a small deck carrier, it's not going to replace a B model. So everybody is very clear in, in understanding that what we're really talking about is an advanced Super Hornet and that mix of airplanes with an F-35C. And I believe the Navy has been very forthright with the Congress and the administration saying, look, in the future, in the next uh, two decades, we're looking to have two squadrons of F-35s and two squadrons of advanced Super Hornets on the deck at any one time. Now, over time, those Super Hornets, even the advanced versions, are not going to be viable in the next 25, 30, 40 years. So they've got to look at putting more F-35s or maybe even a sixth generation airplane uh, in, in the future out there. So, so for us, it, it is not a matter of one versus the other, a zero-sum game. It's a matter of 
if the if the U.S. government can afford it, the Navy needs tactical fighters, and they'd like to buy both F-35s and advanced Super Hornets. Let's go to the cost negotiation, because um, at the time that you were negotiating Lot 10, the president-elect did become involved in that in terms of the conversation with uh, the airplane and its ultimate cost. I know how hard you've worked on this program for five years since you joined it, an extraordinary tenure that you've had in terms of duration, uh, but also impact on the program. How meaningful was uh, now President Trump's intervention in that in getting in changing the cost vector of the program, given that so many analysts looking at it have said the program tracked exactly where we expected it to. What impact did the president have ultimately on the negotiations on the price and schedule? Yeah, when when the new administration um, got involved um, and, and the president-elect was interested in understanding about the F-35, we had been negotiating lots 9 and 10 for 16 months. Okay, and lot number nine um, didn't turn out the way anybody really wanted it to in that the United States Department of Defense had to unilaterally um, dictate a price for the airplane in lot nine, which Lockheed was forced to accept. That's not where we want to be when we're working with our industry partners. So nine was difficult and 10 was going to be even more difficult because it was more airplanes and it was it was caught up in the same kind of issues we had with lot nine. So that's where we were when the new administration came on. When the new administration came on and, and the president-elect got involved and wanted to understand the deal and wanted to put some pressure on industry to drive prices down, two things happened. The first thing that happened was within about 45 days uh, of those conversations, we had a lot 10 settled. The second thing was we had lot 10 settled at a price at which we didn't even think was possible four or five months prior to that. So when folks say there was no effect, I would tell you otherwise. Now, was there going to be significant savings anyway in lot 10? Maybe. Was it going to take a very long time to get there? Probably. But what we did was we got a really good deal for the taxpayers. We saved over $750 million from the price of LRIP9, and we got it done very quickly. So there was an effect there. And now we're on a much better path um, to, to Lot 11 and beyond. On the Lot 9 negotiations, there was a lot of criticism. Uh, there were some analysts who said, look, it's extraordinary, uh, you know, set a very, very bad precedent uh, for the government to have done that uh, at the height of a negotiation. I also understand from, from your guys' perspective, that was a very long-running negotiation, and there were some folks in the government who felt that the concessions were all being made on the government side rather than on the industry side. What can you tell us about those negotiations, why you ultimately had to make that decision um, to, to do something that some people saw as an extraordinary step? And how do you assure people that uh, that's, that's not a lever that the government's going to be pulling more in the future? Well, the, the decision to do that was not taken lightly. And it was taken with a lot of consideration to the highest levels uh, of the department. Um, we just had felt at that point in time that after 16 months uh, of negotiating, um, we had a good idea, or at least we thought we had a good idea, what a fair and reasonable price for those airplanes in Lot 9 were going to be. Um, uh, unfortunately, Lockheed didn't feel that way, and so we felt that further negotiations to try and convince them that it was a fair and reasonable price, or of, for them to convince us that it wasn't, were not going to be fruitful. So uh, with a lot of consideration, uh, we decided to do that. I can tell you unequivocally, that's not the way we want to do business moving forward in the future. That, that, that's the, the, the option of last resort uh, when things like this happen. And, and I think Lockheed and we both recognize that a program of this importance, uh, we need to work better together to make sure that these things go smoother. And from your perspective, the profit that Lockheed is making is a fair profit from your perspective? Absolutely fair. Let me take you to the question of the Paris Air Show. Uh, there was, was uh, some back and forth on that. Uh, obviously, the, the schedule for the overseas introduction of the airplane was waiting for our, our Tier 1 partner. Uh, there was the, the, uh, the Blisk uh, issue that kept the airplane from debuting at Farnborough. 
the next Farm Bro is when it's made its debut last year. Uh, you know, it, it did make it to the Royal International Air Tattoo in between that. And then uh, the folks in Paris were expecting to see the jet. It looks like the aircraft is going to be going to Paris ultimately. It's a two-part question. Part one is, what sort of presence is the airplane going to have in Paris? Is it going to be a flyover? Is it going to be actually operating from uh, the runway? And second, why was there that apparent or seeming disconnect? Because it's not as though people didn't expect the Paris Air Show to be coming. It's something that we knew that the French were very uh, passionate about for the airplane to make its debut. And I think understanding, having spoken to some of their organizers, that, hey, they said, hey, you know, we're not a partner in the program. It should it should debut in a couple of these other countries that are that are tier one partners. What can you tell us about, you know, A, what the, uh, what the airplane is going to be doing when it's over there, but also why why there was that sort of seeming disconnect as we went through this process? Yeah, first and foremost, um, now that we have um, 210 operational airplanes out there, um, the owners and users of those airplanes have a lot more say in where the airplane goes and what it does. So um, the recent decision to take uh, the A model to the Paris Air Show came directly from the United States Air Force and the chief and, and the acting secretary. Um, they had done that after a lot of deliberation. And, and the reason why there was a lot of deliberation had very little to do with the Paris Air Show itself. It has to do with you have a limited number of airplanes in the field right now, and one of your units is already IOC. That unit is now deployed and come back from deploying in Europe, and we're building up the training pipeline. Uh, can the program afford the time and the energy and the effort to bring the airplane over there? Um, we will support that from the JPOS perspective, and Lockheed Martin will support that. But again, it was ultimately up to the warfighter in determining the priorities for their fielded airplanes. And, and, and I'm glad to say that the, the Air Force has decided that they can find um, time in the F-35's busy schedule to go over there, and, and we will support that. Do you know if it's going to be on the, is it going to be actually based in flying out of Le Bourget, or is it going to be operating out of Lake and Heath on a daily flight shuttle program? Yeah, I don't know the exact details right now, but we have started those conversations with the Air Force and industry to figure out how best to support the airplane. Um, I would imagine if the Air Force could, they would want to fly the airplane at the air show. Um, and, and all indications are that if they could do that, they probably would. But depending on the logistics of this, uh, we, have to, we have to think through that. One of the reasons why folks want it to be going to the air show is there is so much international interest still in the program, that it has an unprecedented set of partners that participated in the development, and then the number of countries that are coming aboard in terms of looking at the aircraft as its next fighter, whether it's Japan, whether it's uh, South Korea, whether it's Israel. Um, where I'm interested in is what are some of the new and other nations that may be interested in it? Saudi Arabia have, has expressed interest, United Arab Emirates, and a number of other countries. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the interest and how many more partners do you expect over time this program is going to attract? Yeah, the, the, the number of foreign military sales customers um, that are interested in the airplane, I kind of break it up into to two tiers. Um, the first tier are those countries who we know in the next few years are going to run competitions to replace their fighter fleets. Um, and they have expressed interest in the F-35 and want that F-35 to be part of that competition. For example, Belgium and Finland would fit into those categories. We also believe that eventually Singapore, whether it's a competition or not, would be very interested in looking at the F-35. Those discussions have gotten to the point where um, we actually brief them on, on some of the unclassified capabilities of the airplane, and, and they actually, in some instances, will start a small FMS case with us so we can start passing them the information that they would need to run a competition. And that's where Finland is today. That's where Belgium is today. Um, Singapore has always had a small FMS case with us so they could continue to understand about the F-35 in making their decision. Uh, they're a longtime observer on the program, and they've pres maintained that position to date. They do. Um, then, th then there's a second, second tier of FMS customers who have expressed interest verbally, um, both publicly and to the department, uh, about their desire to, to see if they can someday purchase F-35s, although that's as far as it's, as it's gone. Some of those countries are in the Middle East. Uh, we, we've heard from some European countries like Germany who want to know more about the airplane. And, and so those are, just, those are just things that are just starting out. 
and, and it's always the department's decision on how much we engage with those nations relative to this. And I look to the Pentagon to let me know when it's the right time to, to give them briefings and at what level. You didn't mention prominently Canada. Where we are, where are we with the Canadians that made the decision uh, near term for a Super Hornet, but are maintaining or keeping a door open at least to see whether or not they're they're going to have a role in the F thirty five. Canada has always been a partner on the program, and today they remain a partner on the program. They have voting rights at our our board meetings. They they they, they get to decide the direction of the program and, and maintain full status as a partner. What they've done is. Um, and, and their government has the perfect right to do this, is said they want to take their time and, and, and have another competition to make sure they get the right airplane for Canada. Uh, and we understand that. And, and the JPO and the F-35 is fully supportive of Canada's need to go do that. Um, whether they buy Super Hornets in the interim or not is a decision that Canada gets to make, and, and I won't comment on that. What we do know is they are still partners, they are still interested in the F-35, and we think that given what they know about the program and the future of the airplane, that it'll compete very, very well when the time comes for them to decide. And, and just to clarify, the Canadians have asked for information from us. They haven't made the decision yet to, to, go, to, to go with the F-18, but it certainly did for a while look like it was leaning in that direction with some of the statements that were made from uh, senior Canadian officials. They've since backtracked a little bit on that. Let me now shift you to the acquisition uh, lessons learned part of your career. You've spent 34 years uh, wearing a U.S. Air Force blue, uh, a, you know, an aviator in your own right, a command pilot in your own right, but also somebody who's spent a lot of time in the acquisition world, working in Air Force Special Operations, unmanned aircraft, B-2, KC-46, and now, you know, the smallest program in the world uh, that you could be, uh, that you could be, be associated with. I want to take you to um, the Obama administration did put an enormous focus on acquisition reform. Frank Kendall was a career acquisition professional. He was Ash Carter's deputy, but also then spent six years in the job of, of AT&L, where he was drove forward uh, two extra, you know, three total, but two that had purely Frank's fingerprints on it in terms of the Better Buying Power initiatives. As this new administration comes in, as they try to work to get their own acquisition team in place, as the person who is overseeing the largest military acquisition program, the most complex military acquisition program, the most international military acquisition program. What are some of the advice you would give the incoming team about what was good about better buying power and what, uh, and also try to expand that to also Congress because Senator McCain has played a very prominent role as, as has uh, Chairman Thornberry to try to have Congress, Congress's fingerprints on this. As you look at both what the last administration did but what Congress has been doing, what works from your professional estimation and what might be things that might be better for everybody to consider so that everybody gets to a better place in the future? It's a great question, Vago. I'm going to give you an answer that's not F-35 centric. I'm going to give you an answer based on my 25 plus years of running big and little programs. Um, the acquisition system is always going to be hard to operate and is always going to be complex. Um, there's no doubt about that. But there's surely some things that we can do on the DOD side, and I'll talk about the Congress in a minute, what we can do to make things what I would consider to be um, better. Uh, first and foremost, we have a knack in DOD to clearly underestimate the complexity of developing leading edge technology. And as a result, our estimates on how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost to do something are generally way overly optimistic. Uh, I, I don't remember a program I was ever on from the start of KC-46 to, to this program to any of the other programs where I actually thought that we started the program with a fairly good understanding of how hard it was going to be, but that didn't get turned into realistic estimates about how long it was going to take and how much it was going to cost. So right off the bat, um, we in DOD uh, have got to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, look, if you want to start a program that's got multiple leading edge technologies on it, you've got to figure that it's going to be hard. And we don't like to do that. And the reason we don't like to do that is because early in a program, when you're first trying to start it, you might get sticker shock and that program may never start. So the whole enterprise 
can look forward to either not doing the program because the realistic estimate is too high or, hey, we'll do the best we can. We know, we know this is going to be tough, but let's get it going. And we kind of default to the, okay, let's get it going. And, and we forget that it's going to be really hard. That's the first thing we can probably do is um, in technical jargon for, for the acquisition world, we do most of our long-term cost estimates at the 50% confidence level. That means we're going to be 50% right or 50% wrong. We ought to be doing a little better than that. Maybe we ought to be doing our cost estimates and our schedule estimates at the 80% confidence level um, to, to maybe be assured that some of these programs are going to finish when we expect them to. That's on the upfront estimating side. Second, what I've learned over 25 years is the Big Bang Theory does not work. Okay, what I mean by Big Bang Theory is you get a set of requirements, and the requirements um, are pretty robust, pretty difficult to get to, and you put them all on contract at once, and you try and go from a fourth-generation airplane to a fifth-generation airplane that can do everything. Okay, that is bound to fail for a number of reasons. One, our estimating capability as we move out in time is not nearly as good as if, if it were closer in time. And therefore, those estimates way out there, they're not going to be very good. Second, you're going to find problems along the way, okay? And we don't know how to really do a good job of figuring out where and when those are going to happen. And thirdly, the technology changes. And, and so we're faced with that on the F-35 program where I'm putting certain components in the airplane today that were designed in 2005 and 2006, and the technology's moved a generation or two generations ahead, and I'm going to need to go back and change that eventually. So the Big Bang Theory, for me, doesn't work right. What I'd much prefer to see is a program that is broken up into increments. And you say, okay, we know what the end state needs to be. But to get from here to here, why don't we do it in chunks and see how we do in the first chunk before we really fully commit to the second or the third. That's a smart way of doing business, but you've got a lot of people who don't like that. Okay? The first person who really doesn't like that is the warfighter because he wants to get here. Okay? And if you tell him, no, we're going to start a program and we're only going to go right to here, he's going to go, well, no, I really need to get to here. And unless I see a program that gets me there, I'm not going to be fully supportive. And, oh, by the way, that first increment, probably not as good as something you have in the field today. It might even be a half a step back from what you have today. Congress doesn't like that, putting all that money out there, and your first increment's not even as good as what you already have in the field. The warfighter surely doesn't like that. The industry doesn't like that. But quite frankly, that's, that's the way that you can start maturing the risks if you do it in pieces and in increments. So I would, I would if it were me and they were big programs, I would figure out a way to break them up into little pieces. And then the third part of it is, from the DOD's point of view, you've got to have discipline when you execute a program. And I don't just mean the program office discipline. The comptrollers and the programmers and the requirements folks, all of those big stakeholders in the big acquisition A, they got to have some discipline. You can't be moving money out of a program and expect things to get done in the same amount of time or at the same level for the programmers. For the requirements, guys, if you keep adding requirements as you're moving along, you've got to expect that now you're going to have cost growth and schedule growth, and it's going to be even harder. So we've, we've got to instill some level of discipline at the big A, the big acquisition level with requirements, with funding, with executing the programs. I, I don't see that a lot. I see, I see a lot of end game budgeteering going on that takes money from programs because they have to pay other bills without a real good assessment of what's it going to do to that program. Well, what it's going to do to that program is going to stretch it out, it's going to cost more, and then people wonder why we have big acquisition programs that take too long and cost too much. From the Congress's perspective with acquisition reform, I would tell you that they're simply responding to the fact that if you DOD don't get your own house in order, then we're going to help you get your house in order. So, so if we took care of some of the stuff on the front end in, in our own house, we might, not get DO, we might not get Congress trying to mandate a whole lot of things on us. What I will tell you is there are enough rules and regulations in the acquisition business right now that if you tried to follow them, you couldn't get barely anything done. So any more rules coming in is not what I would suggest the Congress ought to do. Um, they ought to take a look at 
what rules we have and which ones we don't need and get rid of those and then then work with us to figure out which ones are most appropriate because ultimately all the Congress wants is accountability okay they have a, they have a job to oversee um, they have the power of the purse and they want to make sure that the taxpayers money is being spent wisely but ultimately they want accountability in the the DOD acquisition system they want to know who's in charge and if things don't go right who can we turn to to either fix them or hold accountable for that um, I think we've been lacking in that a little bit in DOD because we sometimes don't have very clear chains of authority uh, on certain programs so we could help ourselves um, by, by making that a little clearer um, Relative to breaking up the ATNL job, I don't I, I don't know what the department or how the department is going to uh, organize that way. From my perspective, if I have to go to two milestone decision authorities now, one that's dealing with my development program and maybe one that's dealing with my logistics and sustainment side, I've just split up what I consider to be one of the sacred things of, for a program manager, and that is looking at the total life cycle of the weapon system that I'm developing and making sure that I don't make bad trades one for the other and if I have two folks I have to go to to get permission I'm not I'm not so sure that some of that trade-off um, is is not going to happen let me ask you about the rules I want to go a little bit further on that but I want let me ask you what are the rules that you would scrap what are the, the rules that if you were advising Congress or you're advising the new administration you're advising the new uh, uh, acquisition authorities, let's put it that way, because there'll be two of them, um, or telling General Mattis if you had five minutes with him, what are the rules that you think are the easiest ones that we can scrap in order to make life easier for every program manager out there? Um, it's very, very hard for us in the department when we're talking about some of the larger programs and, and, and some of the more expensive programs to um, plan a five, six, seven, eight year program um, when from year to year you have no idea what your budget's going to be and you have no idea how many of your weapon system you're going to be allowed to buy and you have no idea if you're going to be allowed to buy anything say in advance of that one year. Um, that makes it really, really hard. It becomes a transactional kind of behavior between us and industry and what industry needs to really drive cost out of programs is stability and a long-term knowledge that that program is going to be there so they can invest as well as us. So um, we, we need to somehow figure out from the Congress's point of view how we can give programs a little more flexibility to be assured that from year to year things don't train, change so drastically. Um, we can save and we're going to save a ton of money in the F-35 by um, buying things in bulk eventually. In fact, we have a, a, a legislative proposal going up to the Congress in FY18 to do what we call an economic order quantity buy. We're going to save a couple of billion dollars simply by Congress giving us the authority to buy a bunch of stuff for not just one year, but a couple of years, because industry can give us huge volume discounts. And if you're going to buy F-35s anyway, and I think we are, then why not do that? But that's a hard process to get through the DOD and the Congress. Um, making that kind of decision a little bit simpler would be helpful. But when you're running a large, complicated, long program like the F-35, attempting to plan two, three, four years in advance for a gigantic ramp up or a global sustainment enterprise all over the world, when you have to worry year to year, am I going to get the money I need to run the program like that. It makes it very hard to do that long range planning. It makes it very hard to sign contracts with industry so that you can drive cost and schedule savings into those future years if you're on a year to year transactional basis. So if there was anything I would ask the Congress to think about is maybe relaxing some of the rules on how we have to spend our money year to year. Um, so we can do some more long-range planning and know that the second or third year I'm going to have money to continue on something. Do you um, think that, um, hang on, because your time is short, but I was going to go down a, a slightly different route, but let me see how you got, I... You got 22 minutes. I got 22 minutes. I mean, no pressure. Give ourselves time to, to 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but the, no, the, no, no. the, the disassembling of it is easy. Uh, the disassembly is easy. Uh, I got one other thing for. I got one other thing for. Okay, go, go ahead. Um, I, another thing that um, I've come to learn, uh, especially when you're dealing with large and complicated programs like shipbuilding or or um, airplane development programs, is um, you need some continuity of leadership. Okay, and and unfortunately in the acquisition business. Um, we find that, f at least from our military program manager's perspective, um, we value having, a j having them in a job for a couple of years and then moving them on um, to bigger and better things. I, I can tell you on big programs from the 06 level and above, and even for some of our civilians, having someone in there for three or four or five years is really, really important. Um, they get to know the program, they get to understand industry, um, they'll, they'll do a much, much better job. On this program alone, we used to have the PEO in the job for just two years. I mean, they were the deputy for the first two years, and then they would fleet up and be, and be the PEO for two years. You, on this program, you can't get anything done in two years because it's such a big program. The momentum to change something in two years is just not going to happen. That, that's why the department had decided to leave me in the, the job for five years because I had told them originally, if you really wanted to shift this program in a major way, it was going to take a heck of a lot longer than two years. Years. So the Congress could look at that. DOD can look at that. Um, the answer I get back when I talk to folks about that is leave, when I say you, you've got to leave your key program managers and your key acquisition folks in programs longer, they say, well, they will suffer pro promotion-wise and future job-wise. And I say, but we can change that. But that's within our own doing to be able to change it. And, and why should someone who stays in a job for four years and does a good job running a program be any, any less promotable than someone who's had two different jobs at two different program offices? Um, that's something within our own control, and I think we ought to look at that for some of our major programs. Let me ask you for the rationale for the block buy. That's something that's important. You've been talking about it for a while. Do you feel that Congress is going to back it? What's the case that you're making up on the Hill, but also in the department about why that's so important? Yeah, so it, it's it's a little bit complicated, but not all that complicated. So some of our partners um, already have approval from their parliaments to buy a certain number of airplanes, regardless of what year it is, and a certain amount of money. For those partners, they're going to buy lots 12, 13, and 14 in a block, okay, akin to a multi-year. It's not what the U.S. services are going to do, but that's what they're going to do. What the U.S. services are actually going to do is they're going to buy each of their lots of airplanes as individual lots based on appropriation and authorization from the Congress year by year. But what we're asking the Congress to do in FY18 is allow us to spend about uh, 600 plus million dollars to buy components in an economic order quantity for the next two lots of airplanes instead of just that one year's lot. When we combine that EOQ buy with our partners who want to do the block buy, you get a synergy from industry that says, well, now I know I have a production run of at least three years. Now I know you're buying parts for that production run in advance, so I can give you volume discounts. I can make my own investments in improving manufacturing and producibility. Um, and you'll still come down the learning curve because the numbers are still there. When you put all of that together in just lots 12, 13, and 14, Compared to what you'd pay in a lot 11, we're going to save somewhere over $2 billion just in those three years. And I call that the gift that keeps on giving. Because once you start reducing the price of the airplane like that in lots 12, 13, and 14, that's the jumping off point for lot 15 and beyond. So the quicker you can come down that cost curve, the better off you are in the out years. It's a compelling case. Um, again, we're not asking for a lot, but we are asking for approval to be able to spend two years worth of VOQ in one year. 
and and that's the, the big thing that's going over on the hill we've had a lot of conversations with the with the defense committees about this they understand what we're trying to do we've had conversations with OMB about this they understand what we're trying to do we think it syncs up very nicely with what the new administration wants to do and what Mr. Kendall and Dr. Carter wanted to do with better buying power. The risks are low and the payoff is pretty high, and, and it, it's a win-win for both the industry and, and the F-35 program. You were, uh, you have spoken, uh, given your tenure and your experience on the program about the problems of F-35. You answered the question more broadly earlier about uh, acquisition lessons learned in your career. On the F-35, is there anything new you want to say or different? You know, you've been thinking about this question about what was done right on F-35 and what was done wrong on F-35 that has uh, kept you working 24 hours a day, 365 days uh, for, for the last five years on this program, uh, which, which I'm sure your family is also going to be glad to get to see a little bit more of you uh, now. But, you know, what, do you have a, a, a revised view of what you think was gotten right on this program and what, for God's sakes, are the warning bells to never again repeat on any other program? Yeah. Especially as we, as both the Air Force and the Navy, again, talk about a sixth generation airplane and, and a focus on that. And there are some folks saying, hey, let's come together. There are some folks who say, oh, hell no, you know, we shouldn't get any, any closer. You know, what's, what's, what's your sense on that? Yeah, there's, there, there's some pretty good lessons learned that coming out of the F-35 program in my five years here. Um, first and foremost, as I said before, uh, I think we were way overly optimistic early on in this program to think that we could put that many new technologies into a weapon system and do it on the timelines for the money we had. The notion of fifth generation LO, fusion of sensors, a helmet that without a HUD, um, those are fairly leading edge technologies, and, and I think we under, clearly underestimated how hard that was going to be uh, in overall integration to make it all work. Um, so again, back to, the, um, back to being over, overly optimistic. Um, second, this program started under a different concept than where we are today, and that concept was called TISPR, T-S-P-R, which stood for Total System Performance Responsibility. And what that meant was that back in the day, back in the early, the late 90s and early 2000s, um, uh, we kind of convinced ourselves that part of the problem with major acquisition programs was we had too many specs and too many overarching oversight things that the government was doing. And it would be better to give most or all of that responsibility to industry and kind of get out of their way. And that's how this program started. I can tell you I am not a strong proponent of that. Okay, industry and government sometimes overlap in what they need to do, but they don't always overlap. And the, and the government needs a more assertive role um, in running big programs like this in terms of the requirements, in terms of executing the dollars, in terms of what we need to do. This program did not start out that way, and, and it, it, it proved to be costly for us. Um, thirdly, um, I think the notion of concurrency on this program was taken to the extreme. Um, we started the production line long before we even flew our first test sortie. Every program has to have some level of concurrency um, because you couldn't run a program serially, you know, and, and get it done in a reasonable amount of time. So there has to be an overlap of the different phases. And the classic overlap is between the development and the testing with the production. On this program, we enjoyed a level of concurrency that I had never seen before. Um, and it was not, and, and it cost us. And, and how did it cost us? It cost us because I have 210 airplanes in the field today, and I've got another 80 or 90 coming off the production line, and none of them are in the final full configuration of the airplane because over the years we found out so many things we had to change that we, we, had, to, we had to redesign portions of it. But by the time that got into the production line, those airplanes were long gone. So I'm going to have, we're going to have nearly 300 airplanes out there that over the next few years are going to have to come back and get modded to be a full, you know, capable F-35. That, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I think from a concurrency perspective, um, uh, we probably could have done a better job there. Last one is running joint programs. Okay, this is, this is a joint program like no, no other. We have eight partners, three FMS customers, and three services. Um, I think there is a place for joint programs in DOD, but I don't think there's a place for a program that thinks that they can build one platform with three variants that can serve three very, very different users with very, very different requirements. Um, and we're learning that. 
Um, the airplane was supposed to start off about 70% common. Today, it's probably about 20 or 25% common from a hardware perspective. That's because building an airplane that lands on an aircraft carrier at 130 knots is very, very different than building an airplane that needs to vertically take off and land. Um, but we tried to do that all in one. So my suggestion to DOD would be don't give up on joint programs, but let's look at those technologies that can truly be joint and, and, and develop those jointly and then build them into portions of other programs. So on the F-35, for example, most of the system, mission system software and the vehicle system software is common across all the variants. You could develop that jointly. The weapons we're putting on the airplanes, you could d develop that jointly. The helmet, the same. You could develop that jointly. But when it comes to maybe the airframe and the flying characteristics and what it needs to do, m maybe you don't m maybe you don't start off joint. Maybe you start off with three program offices that then tap into the jointness of those other things, like an engine, A model and C model engine, exactly the same. And you use the jointness where it's best used and keep the uniqueness where it needs to be, I think everybody will find that that'll be a little more um, friendly for, for, for everybody. And, and you'll still save some money. You'll still save some money, and, and you'll still be efficient, but everybody will kind of um, get what they want instead of having to compromise so from, much. From an obsolescence standpoint, um, what's the best way to handle that? This is a program that's been under development for 20 years. You said there are going to be 300 jets that are going to have to come home and get fixed. You're already dealing with an obsolescence problem on parts that were coming in in 05, 04, 06 that are now outmoded. How do you, how do you address that? Do you have to go more to form, fit, and function uh, specification? Now, how do you handle that? Because it's been a challenge. I mean, on the F-22 program, I think we went to two or three cycles on that by the time the aircraft was even fully fielded. How do you address that challenge? So one of the things you need to do up front is you need to take a look at the systems and the components that you're trying to develop and, and try and look ahead and say, these are the components, the technologies that we know over time are going to change. Um, computers and software, you know, the software we run on computers, you know, th that's gonna change from now until, you know, forever. So you ought to be prepared when you start the program to understand that you need to insert technology at appropriate points and plan for it and plan for it. Not only to take care of the diminishing manufacturing sources, but to take advantage of the future technologies that have yet to be built. But if you plan for those, even though you don't know, maybe know specifically what that technology is, you have a better chance of running a long production program that doesn't end up obsolete at the end. I, I can tell you things like computers uh, on the airplane, sensors, certain sensors like e electro, electro optical sensors, uh, even in some instances radars. You know those are going to continue to evolve time and time again. So you ought to build your program with specific technology insertion points uh, to, to keep pace. The better answer really is to do things in increments so when you get to your next increment, you're ready for the new technology. But if you can't do that, then, then you've got a plan for that. And that requires a, a good partnership between industry and the department to be able to look into the future and understand what's coming down the road and how it can apply to your weapon system and build that in build that technology insertion and that DMS program from the beginning. We didn't do very much of that early on in the F-35 program, and we're finding now to keep the weapon system viable in the future, we've got to do a lot more of it. Three final questions. I know your time is short and you've been so generous with us as it is. First, um, there are those who say that the department is airing too much for uh, lowest cost, uh, for that they're putting um, unit cost ahead of the efficacy of the platform. There are some who look, for example, at the B-21 program and say that there is not enough margin that's been built into the airplane that was finally selected uh, and, and that that's going to cause downstream challenges. What's the right approach? What's the right balance point? Because ultimately these systems are going into service not just because they're the lowest cost to operate per hour or the lowest cost to acquire, but are the ones that are delivering the greatest capability. Um. Yeah, there's a balance there, and that, that, that's a, a tough balance to figure out. I would tell you there are some instances where um, the technologies are so similar and, and provide a level of advantage for us, no matter which vendor you go to or, or how you implement that technology, that the low price might be the right way to go. 
Um, the important thing there is, and, and, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the B-21, although I do not know a lot about it. I think the B-21 guys, they came and talked to the F-35 and me and our program a lot before they put the requirements in place. They talked to other 5th Gen, F-22. They talked to B-2. Um, I think they got it just about right when it came to what can we develop in the near term and make sure that we don't run into any dead-end streets in the future. So what you're seeing maybe in the B-21 is what we talked about. That first increment of the B-21 is not the be-all or end-all, and you're already hearing people criticize that. I think probably from their perspective, they're looking more long-term for those incremental upgrades and ensuring that the growth can be there. Um, people just don't like what they see up front because it's not that shiny thing at the end that they thought it was going to be. So. Um, there is a role. There is a role for um, low cost, technically acceptable. Um, but if you want to maintain a combat advantage over your enemies, and you never want to go into any fight fair, you always want to be better. There's some element of risk to that, and that risk probably costs you some money. So you might not always be able to go to the lowest cost guy. Uh, well, look, it's worth pointing out that the F-16 was a light day fighter, and it has evolved to a multi-mission, all weather, day night. Uh, strike, recce, everything else. So it's it's Great it's answer. it's it's mer it's evolved into that program. Um, let me ask you two last questions. First, um, you know when you became the program manager, a uh, lot of expectation. You made it clear there was a new sheriff in town. Some of the comments you made originally were seen as a little controversial in terms of uh, rolling up the newspaper and 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 seen as uh, hitting all the contractors uh, a little bit on the head. Particularly, it was at the point at, at Lockheed. As you look back on your tenure on the five years, what are the things and the accomplishments? about which you're most proud, what are the things that if, as you look at, and if you had a do-over, that you do over again and tell your successor, Admiral Winter, somebody who has a deep uh, uh, knowledge of programs and of technology, you know, hey, here are some things maybe that should be the focus and priority items for you as you go forward. I think one of the things that I'm probably most proud of in our five years here is when I came into the Joint Program Office, um, our team, our JPO family, um, was in the midst of a two-year replan coming out of the Nun McCurdy breach, and they were very, very focused on replanning a program. And prior to that, um, this JPO, my JPO family, was beat up pretty good for many, many years. Um, uh, lots of criticism about how we executed the program or how we didn't execute the program. So when I came in, they were one focused on replanning and two uh, morale was pretty low and they were pretty pretty beat up um, the thing I'm most proud of is that JPO out there today is a great acquisition organization okay they took charge of this program they have learned how to execute the most complex program in DOD and I will tell you five years ago we weren't sure if we could get here or not and, and, and one thing I always thank them for is allowing me to lead them on that journey um, because they let me take them where they didn't want to go sometimes. And, and as a result of that, we, ha we have a JPO team out there um, that can face any challenge and can run the most complicated program in DOD and do it pretty well. Second thing I'm, I'm proud of is I think we've changed the tone about the F-35. Now I'll tell you the biggest thing that helped changing the tone on the F-35 is when you hand it to the warfighter and he goes out, he or she goes out and uses it and starts lauding it himself or herself, it makes it so much easier for a program manager. And we finally got to do that a couple of years ago when we started fielding the airplane and we got those IOCs out there for the Marine Corps um, and the Air Force. So um, I think we've changed the tone. I think the tone of the program when I first got here was, is this program going to survive? Is it, st is it still going to be uh, a problem child? Is it, are we still going to look to see who's going to put the final um, sword in it to kill it? Um, today we're not talking about that. Today we're talking about this program is going to succeed. It's going to be a game changer. There's a lot of other FMS customers and folks that are dependent on this airplane, and, and I think I'm pretty my team should be very, very proud of that for, for that turnaround. What I would tell my incoming um, uh, deputy PEO who's fleeting up, Matt Winter, is first of all, he's an absolute excellent choice for this job. He's got the demeanor, the personality, the know-how, um, the smarts, the acquisition savvy, and the reputation um, to move this program forward to the next, next level. 
What I do, what we do talk about a lot is the character of the program is changing. It was very developmental and flight test centric for years. Uh, now we're in a production, a fielding, and a future very, very large sustainment program. So he has to be willing to change the JPO and to make sure industry changes along with us to be able to reflect what the program really is going to become. And that eventually is going to be some development in modernization, but a very big production program and a huge global sustainment program. And, and we have to have the skill sets and the ability to, to change as the program changes. And I think that's going to be his biggest challenge. And as you take off the Air Force blue uniform after 34 years, uh, what's next? Uh, what's, you know, what are you proudest of overall in your, in your career? And tell us a little bit about what's next for Chris Bogdan and the Bogdan family. So what am I most proud of uh, as an Air Force officer? Um, it's not all the accolades. It's not being DGs from schools. It's not running biggest programs. It's the impact I've had on the folks that have worked for me and the folks that I've worked for. Um, I have always tried in my career to make sure that I can be a good mentor, uh, a good leader by example to folks. And, and what I found over the years is uh, as I get to retire, I, I see and hear from a lot of people that I knew in my past um, who say a couple of things. One, they say, boy, you've never changed. And I think that's, I like that because I didn't change. I am who I was when I was a lieutenant. And, and, and I've made an impact on folks, and, and, and I, I enjoy making an impact uh, on those folks for the better. So that's probably what I'm most proud about. Um, what's next? I'm going to take a breather. Um, my wife and I um, are just going to move across the river here for about six months. Um, we're going to take our time and figure out what's next. Um, I loved serving our country. Uh, I can't imagine that somewhere in my future I wouldn't go back into some kind of serving our nation in one capacity or another. Um, but for now, we're not sure. We're just going to take a breather and visit all our family members and friends that we didn't get to see over 34 years. General Bogdan, thanks very much. Thanks for being so open. Fair winds and following seas and very much looking forward to staying in touch because I think you've mentored people far and wider than just in the Air Force uh, and, and, uh, and been, been a good example for them too. Thanks very much for all your service. Well, thanks, Vago. You've been a great friend. You, you've been one of the few reporters out there who seeks the truth and, and, and tries to tell it like it is. And, and I appreciate you doing that. And I hope to see you around a lot in this business. Sir, thanks very much. I really appreciate that. All the best. Thanks. Thank you.